Welcome to Football Game Plan's FCS Kickoff presented by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. I'm Emory Hunt, the czar of the playbook, and round one is done. Now it's on to round two in the FCS playoffs. Here's what we have on tap for episode 31 of the FCS kickoff. We'll break down next round, the next round of games this week in the FCS playoffs. And also, Grambling's head coach, Broderick Fobbs, has done a sensational job rebuilding and turning around his alma mater. And we'll take a look at his process and what has made them so successful. And this week, there's a college all-star game that's taking place cater to the FCS, appropriately named the FCS Bowl. And we'll preview that game and take a look at the rosters and some of the players to definitely keep an eye on. But first, let's go into our four-minute offense and take a look at some of the top storylines as we head into week 14 of the FCS. Would Grambling State's blowout victory over the Southern Jaguars in the Bayou Classic, the Tigers captured the West Division title and punched their ticket to the SWAT Championship game this week in Houston, Texas, where they'll face the East Division champs, the Alcorn State Braves. Now, this is a rematch of last year's game where the Braves dismantled the Tigers and went on to face North Carolina A&T in the inaugural Celebration Bowl. This year, the Tigers are looking for revenge and to make the trip to Atlanta this year to face the North Carolina Central Eagles. This week in the FCS playoffs, the top eight seeds are in action and should be well rested as all eight are coming off bye weeks. Three of the matchups in Villanova, South Dakota State, Richmond versus North Dakota, and Central Arkansas versus Eastern Washington are cross-country matchups. And we'll see if that'll have an impact or an effect on the games this Saturday. Now is the time of year where you're starting to hear a lot of coaching changes and see some movements amongst the coaching staffs, etc. But last week we heard a rumor that Illinois State head coach Brock Spack was linked to the Purdue job. As you may know, Spack coached at Purdue under the legend Joe Tiller. And we also look at Cornell and Stephen F. Austin. They also had some positional openings as well as assistants have either resigned or taken other opportunities. And I'm pretty sure we'll see much more movement as the weeks pass. Speaking of coaching changes, the Howard Bison will not renew the contract of Gary Harrell, the head coach, which leaves a head coach opening in the nation's capital. Now, Harrell is a guy that's a Howard guy through and through, having been a player there and also getting his coaching start there with the Bison. And this is a surprising move, in my opinion, as I felt as though he was slowly getting things turned around in D.C. Let's take a look back at last week and hand out some Player of the Week awards. Our Offensive Player of the Week goes to New Hampshire senior running back Dalton Crossan, who ran for 184 yards and two touchdowns as the Wildcats were able to route Lehigh 64 to 21. Crossan averaged a healthy 7.7 .7 yards per carry on just 24 touches. He also had a receiving touchdown as well. Defensive Player of the Week award goes to Villanova's defensive end Tano Passigno, the 6'7", 290-pound senior, had five tackles, two and a half TFLs, and two and a half sacks as Villanova knocked off St. Francis at home, 31 to 21. And finally, our Special Teams Player of the Week honor goes to the entire Richmond Spiders Special Teams unit. Dejon Brissett had a 92-yard punt return for a touchdown that started the stealing of momentum in that ball game, and kicker Griffin Trow connected on all three of his extra points and went four for four on his field goal attempt. So needless to say that the Spiders special teams came through in the clutch for them to grab the victory. And we'll take a quick break and be back after this. I think FCS presents such a great opportunity, you know, at, at a school like Fordham and the rest of the Patriot League schools to, to get the best of both worlds. 
college. You're talking about you know some of the top 60 academic institutions in the in the country. Combine that with you know full scholarship Division One football that's able to compete on a national level. I, I think you know in the from a recruiting standpoint and, and talking to the other coaches, that's what we're identifying. We're identifying guys that that academics and football are equally important. Um, not one more than the other, but truly equally important. I think that's the strength of, of FCS football, certainly in the Patriot League. the next level in the amazing world of broadcast and entertainment media. I mentored several interns here at the Covino and Rich Show at SiriusXM, and the ones from CSB always stand out to me. They have a knowledge of the equipment, uh, knowledge of editing, what it's like to be in a studio, and that always eliminates a huge learning curve. Their professional studios give students a hands-on, learn-by-doing approach using equipment used in actual radio stations and TV studios. Visit our website at gocsb.com or call 1-800-TV-RADIO. Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Start today. The FCS Bowl takes place this weekend in sunny Daytona Beach, Florida. And if you haven't heard about this game, you're definitely missing out because it features a lot of the top players across the country in the FCS. The FCS National Bowl is an annual postseason college football all-star game consisting of the top players from FCS schools. Now, the FCS Bowl is presented by East Preps LLC and founded by Michael Corte. These rosters give the NFL and CFL scouts a chance to view and get to know some of the best players from smaller schools over the bowl weekend. Now, you can find the full rosters at www.fcsbowl.com, but here are a few of the players that I'll be keeping a watchful eye on this weekend. Josh Strawhand of Southern Illinois is one of the more accurate passers in the FCS, and once Stillman College dropped football, Strawhand transferred up to Southern Illinois and took over the starting job, completing over 67% of his passes for 2,400 yards, throwing 15 touchdowns to only four interceptions in eight games. Now, he's been a bit banged up over the season, but he's a player that can definitely raise some eyebrows in this bowl game, just like he's done all season long. In his last start versus Missouri State on October 29th, Strawhand connected on 29 of 39 passes for 315 yards and two touchdowns. Devin Borders of Eastern Kentucky is a big receiver that also plays big at 6'5", 220. Borders is a big-time weapon in the red zone for the Colonels and has been a consistent player for them for his entire career. Borders led the team in receiving this season with 40 receptions, 739 yards, and six touchdowns, and I'll be looking to see what type of nuance that he has in this game in the FCS Bowl. Former Lamar defensive end Lorenz Hill wasn't on the team this year, but in 2015, he was virtually unblockable up front. So this is a big week for him because it gets him back out there on the field playing football, and many will want to see if the same combination of quicks and explosiveness is still there after the year layoff. Now, the scouts will also want to hear from him directly on why he was dismissed from that Cardinals football team. Willie Duncan has been a bright spot on the Arkansas Pine Bluff defense this season. He's a stocky linebacker at 5'11", 235, but shows good ability to blitz and also play back in coverage. Now, he's been on the radar for a while, and I'm surprised that he's not getting talked about more. And I'm definitely looking forward to seeing how he plays in this game. Jahad Pretlow of Fordham is not only a solid cover man, but a dynamic returnman as well. Now, what he'll have to show this week and in the game is that he can match up well in man coverage versus faster wide receivers. The speed will be his biggest question mark, but the playmaking ability he provides as a returner will definitely give him a shot at the next level.
Welcome to the Big Sky, I'm Anthony Crescenzo. As the second round approaches this weekend, the top two teams in Big Sky both have home field advantage. Co-conference champions North Dakota University, who are seventh seed in the tournament, will host the now 9-3 Richmond Spiders, who beat NC A&T 39-10. Richmond has a 5-3 record this season in the Colonial Athletic Association and they face the Fighting Hawks team who not only are the co-conference champs but did it without losing a single game in the conference this season. This will be the first meeting of the two teams. Both of these teams are very well coached as coach Bubba Schwager was named the Big Sky Coach of the Year and coach Danny Rocco was Colonial's Coach of the Year last year. The biggest weapon the Spiders have in this game is experience. This is their third consecutive year in the playoffs and they beat the Grizz in 2008 for the national championship. On the other side of the coin, North Dakota is playing their first FCS playoff game. Expect a total score of under 50 points as this is probably going to be a smash mouth running game. The number two Eastern Washington Eagles will host the 14th ranked Central Arkansas Bears after their 31-24 win over Illinois State. The Eagles will hold their 8-0 conference record up against Southland Conference runner-up at 8-1. These two teams will be meeting for the first time. And coach Bo Baldwin says the Bears' athleticism and playmaking ability stood out against Illinois State, who he faced in the 2014 playoffs. This game will feature two of the top 20 offenses in the nation, as Eastern has the number two offense in the country, while Central is 19th. Baldwin coached Eastern Washington to the national title game in 2010, which is the last time the conference won the title for football. Baldwin has the Big Sky's Offensive Players of the Year in quarterback Gabe Gubrud and NFL ready FCS record-breaking wide receiver Cooper Cup. Gubrud leads the nation in total offense with 112 yards per game. Cup is the FCS All-American leader in receiving yards, receptions, and total touchdowns. Wide receiver Kendrick Bourne has 26 touchdowns and is closing on 3,000 receiving yards. Shaq Hill has 30 touchdowns and 2,675 receiving yards, both were named All-Conference. Defensive end Samson Ibukan has six and a half sacks this season and 21 for his career. Makaya Zamora has 341 tackles for his career so far. While we're talking All-Conference players, let's look at who makes Southlands for the Bears. Wide receiver, Desmond Smith. Offensive lineman, Stockton Mallett. All-purpose player, Jatavius Wilson. Defensive lineman, Jordan Tolliver. Plus, defensive backs, Traymond Smith, George Odom, and Tyler Williams. This could be a reasonable matchup in the secondary. But between experience and explosiveness, I can't see the Eagles not lighting up the scoreboard. I'm not saying that Central Arkansas is that bad. I'm saying Eastern Washington is that good. With only 16 teams left in the FCS playoffs, all four CAA teams remain. The Colonial Athletic Association holds a quarter of the playoff spots to this point. They went 3-0 with James Madison having a first round bye. Up first, we have Richmond taking on the number seven seed, North Dakota. North Dakota was 9-2 this year and came in second place in the Big Sky behind the two seed Eastern Washington and is coming off of their first round bye. Richmond is coming off of a dominant 39-10 victory over North Carolina A&T. Even without their star redshirt junior quarterback Kyle Lalletta, they were able to get their explosive offense going early and often. Sophomore quarterback Kevin Johnson threw for 315 yards and a touchdown in his first career start. The Spiders defense was able to hold the Aggies to 226 total yards and turn them over four times. Richmond will need to keep the, that magic going in order to take down the Fighting Hawks. Up next we have Villanova. Villanova's offense was able to keep their offensive momentum going from the final week of the regular season, beating the NEC champs St. Francis 31-21. Sophomore quarterback Zach Bednarsik threw for three touchdowns in the first half alone. The Wildcats' top-ranked CAA defense was able to hold the red flash to 27 rushing yards and picked off two passes. 
In the second round, they will be taking on the eighth seed South Dakota State Jackrabbits, coming off of their first round bye. If Villanova can keep up their offensive role and continue to dominate defensively behind senior linebacker Austin Calitro, Villanova will have a chance to steal one this week. And finally, we have an exciting CAA showdown in the second round of the playoffs. The New Hampshire Wildcats will be traveling to Harrisonburg, Virginia to take on the CAA Conference Champions. The Wildcats looked the most impressive out of any team in my opinion last week. They beat down the Patriot League champs, Lehigh, by a score of 64 to 21. New Hampshire's offense gained a total of 637 yards. Senior running back Dalton Croson contributed to that total with his 184 rushing yards and two touchdowns. Senior quarterback Adam Reese also tossed three touchdowns. Their defense was able to force four turnovers on top of all that. So that defense against JMU's top-ranked offense looks to be the top matchup of the second round. One thing to watch out for is to see if Brian Shore will be able to play. The CAA Offensive Player of the Year was injured against Villanova and has not played since. If he is not able to play or is not 100%, the Dukes could be at a disadvantage. They do still have their 1,000-yard rusher, Khalid Abdullah. Will New Hampshire be able to pull off the upset? We're all going to have to tune in to find out this weekend. Good luck to all the CAA teams this Saturday. For the Missouri Valley Football Conference, I'm Brian Sullivan. It was certainly an exciting round one of the playoffs that saw the thrill of victory as Youngstown State pulled off the upset against Sanford and advanced to the second round and the agony of defeat as Illinois State came up just short against Central Arkansas. Now Redbird Nation should keep their heads up high after an amazing season that saw them come out of nowhere to win three straight including knocking off co-champs South Dakota State and ranked Western Illinois to end the season and make the playoffs and taking Central Arkansas to the limit. Things are definitely looking up for them next season. Now let's look at round two, starting off by heading to Fargo, North Dakota, where number one NDSU looks to earn their 18th straight home playoff victory as they host San Diego. The Toreros, coming off the biggest upset victory in FCS playoff history, bringing their number one FCS scoring defense with 12.1 points allowed and total defense with 249 and a half yards per game, and they will need it as they face a bison offensive line that has been outstanding all year in opening up the running game for running backs King Frazier and Lance Dunn. If San Diego's defense can't stuff up the holes and get pressure, Bison quarterback Easton Stick will have all day to pass to his favorite receivers, RJ Erzanowski and Darius Shepard. Now on the flip side, San Diego's offense led by quarterback Anthony Lawrence, who had 296 yards and two TDs, and running back Johan Hodges, who had three scores last week, will have to figure out a way to keep a uh, Bison's defense in check that has gotten better every week since their heart and soul linebacker Nick DeLuca went out for the season in week three. My prediction for this game is North Dakota State dominates on all sides of the ball and wins 35 to 14. Next, let's head to South Dakota State where the number eight Jackrabbits will host Villanova in a battle of offense versus defense. The Wildcats bring in their number three ranked FCS defense led by defensive end Tora Kapasignan, sorry I hope I got that correct, and the best linebacking core in the tournament, headlined by NFL ready linebacker Austin Calitro. The defense dominated St. Francis last week coming up with six sacks. They face a Jackrabbits offense that has torn up the league all year with their three-headed offensive monster attack led by dual-threat quarterback Tyron Christian who has over 3,300 yards passing and 29 touchdowns to go along with his six rushing TDs. He is joined by his two favorite receivers, tight end Dallas Godert, who became the first tight end in league history to have over 1,000 yards to go along with his 10 scores, and NFL-ready wide receiver Jake Winicky, who has over 1,200 yards and 16 TDs this season. If Villanova can keep Christian contained and put pressure on him, the Wildcats have a legitimate shot to upset the Jackrabbits. My prediction here is South Dakota State 24-21. And finally, in the upset game of the week, the Penguin Nation of Youngstown State head to number three Jacksonville State in another game of offense versus defense. Jacksonville State's number nine FCS ranked offense is led by quarterback Eli Jenkins, who has torn up the league all year. He leads the team in passing with over 1,900 yards and 10 TDs and rushing with 795 yards and 12 touchdowns. He will face his toughest test of the season by far as Penguin Nation brings in their frightening shutdown defense led by NFL-ready defensive end Derek Rivers and his partner in crime defensive end Avery Moss and their experienced secondary that destroyed Stanford last week. Youngstown State will run the ball once again with running back Jody Webb 
who rushed for 174 yards and two TDs, and Martin Ruiz, who had 78 yards, in order to keep the ball out of Eli Jenkins' hands like they did with Sanford's quarterback Hodges. If Penguin Nation can run the ball freely again, win the time of possession, and their scary defense once again dominates, Youngstown State should win. I predict Penguin Nation pulls off the upset 24-17. Hey there, OVC fans. For Football Game Plan, I'm Luke Jackson with a look at what's going on in the conference as we head into playoff action here in 2016. Unfortunately, a couple of late season swoons only allowed for one OVC team to make the 24 team field this year. For the third straight season, the Jacksonville State Gamecocks are your Ohio Valley Conference champions with an 8-0 record in conference play. The Gamecocks became the first team since the 1982 through 84 Eastern Kentucky Colonels to win three straight OVC titles and the first team in the history of the league to go undefeated in league play over three years. With a 10-1 overall record, the Gamecocks were given the third overall seed by the playoff committee and will host Youngstown State on Saturday for the right to advance to the semifinals next weekend. Now this game will be the first ever meeting between the two schools. Now Youngstown State was a part of the Ohio Valley Conference from 1981 through 87, but that was before Jacksonville joined in 2003. It'll be a game decided in the trenches, as both teams have stout rushing attacks and stalwart rushing defenses. Jacksonville State's ninth ranked ground game will look to put points on the board against a Youngstown team that has only allowed four rushing touchdowns all season. On the other side of the ball, Jacksonville State's number two ranked defense, which gives up just over 250 yards per game, will look to stop a Youngstown attack that put up almost 40 points last week against Samford. Third down will be a key for both teams as Youngstown's offense comes in converting at almost a 50% clip, but Jacksonville State's defense only allows teams to convert one out of every four and a half times. So look for that to be a major key for the game. Now I don't see a ton of points being scored and Youngstown has a coach in Bo Pelini who has been successful at the highest level. But Jacksonville has the home field advantage, a great defense, and All-American quarterback Eli Jenkins. I think that's the difference in a close game and the Gamecocks beat the Penguins and advance to the semifinals. Let's say 24-13 Jacksonville State. For Football Game Plan, this is Luke Jackson saying, enjoy the weekend of football, FCS fans. Welcome back to the FCS Kickoff, presented by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. I'm Emory Hunt, the czar of the playbook, and it's now time to start previewing the games that are on the schedule this week in the FCS. And we'll start down in Houston, Texas, with the SWAC Championship game as the Alcorn State Brace of the East Division take on the Grambling State Tigers of the West. These two teams met up earlier in the season and Grambling won 43-18 and that game was considered payback for last year's SWAC title game loss but this game in my opinion is the actual payback. Now the Tigers passing game can't have an off day nor can their run defense. Alcorn has the ability to wear down opponents with their rushing attack and they also have a defense that does a great job in generating pressure. I don't think we'll see either in this game with the level of consistency needed to win. I like Grambling to take care of business and move on to the Celebration Bowl. This will be must-see TV here between Chattanooga and Sam Houston State. The reason being is that you have a great defense in Chattanooga going up against a great offense in Sam Houston State. Now the challenge in this game for the Mox will be to steal possessions away from the Bearcats. It's just like fishing an option team. You steal a possession away, you drain some clock and hope that the drive ends up in points. That's a clear path for Chattanooga to win this ball game. Now for Sam Houston, it's about owning the line of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. They do a great job of getting rid of the football quickly in their passing game, which helps out their offensive line. And they're led defensively by defensive tackle PJ Hall, who's a terror on the interior. It's supposed to be a rain-soaked day in Huntsville, Texas, 
One would think that would make the passing game inconsistent at best for both sides. I just think that'll slow Sam Houston State down a bit, but I don't know if Chattanooga offensively is built that way to capitalize. So look for a defensive battle with the Bearcats coming out on top. And finally, we have another rematch this week. This time it involves two SoCon opponents as Wofford travels to the Citadel. High-level option football is great to watch. And in rematch games, it's all about the adjustments. And I think if you're Wofford, you understand that you played a great game in the first meeting, but the late interception cost you the victory. Ball security and working on their four-minute offense was probably the focal point heading into this week. Now, the Citadel, in my opinion, does a great job of mixing in their passing game within their option attack perfectly. I will look to more of a game plan that they use against East Tennessee State this week versus the Terriers. Now, quarterback Dominique Allen has to make sure to be accurate with the football when he does throw the ball in this ball game. This will look a lot like the first matchup, a tug of war between two very good ball clubs for four quarters. I just see the Citadel's defense and special teams making key plays early in the game to give them a safe cushion to win throughout. So that's it for this week's episode of the FCS Kickoff presented by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. I'm Emery Hunt, the czar of the playbook, and be sure to follow us on all of our social media accounts. And also don't forget to check out and subscribe on iTunes to our FCS Opening Drive podcast. <laughs>